Very good. Okay, greetings, everyone. We're here with another editorial board meeting about a topic that I know is important to a lot of people. And what is it with these electric cars and all of that? So we'll learn a little bit more about that. And who do we have? Why don't we introduce ourselves before we get started? I'll let them know that on our editorial board, we have uh, with us uh, Jeffrey Lord, uh, Gloria Merrick, Dr. Namal Joshi, uh, the Reverend Sandy Strauss, and we also have listening in our Capitol uh, Hill reporter, uh, reporter from the Pennsylvania Capitol, Jan Murphy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our guests to uh, identify themselves and to begin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy to be with the board today. Elaine LeBalm, Communications Director with EDF Action, the Advocacy Partner of Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you for having us here today. And I'm here with our David Kiva, President of EDF Action, who is going to uh, talk about EVs and the, uh, the conversation that is uh, that is taking place right now. All yours, David. Great. Well, thank you all for, for having me today. It's really an honor and a, a privilege to be here and to be here with you from Harrisburg. Uh, I'm pleased to share that this morning we had a pretty well attended uh, press event on the steps of the state capitol to try to tell the truth about electric vehicles and the transition that is taking place in this country and the benefit that it is having uh, to, and we'll soon have for, I, I believe, every Pennsylvanian uh, and all Americans. Uh, we heard a variety of different perspectives. We, we were pleased to have State Representative Justin Fleming from right here in Dauphin County join us. Um, he talked about the, the boost that federal support was giving to the state we had Ed Hill, an international representative from the IBEW, join us. Uh, he drove over from Pittsburgh last night. He lives right here in Pennsylvania. We had Dr. Deborah Gentile, uh, a pediatric asthma doctor and specialist from St. Francis University, who you probably are, are familiar with, who talked about the enormous health impacts that uh, reducing our transportation emissions would, would um, bring about. And we also had Susan Quinn, uh, a regular civilian, real person who's on her third electric vehicle, who talked about the difference in quality between the first one she bought them and in what she described as, um, you know, the Jurassic area era of electric vehicles to today and how pleased she is with the offerings. And that dovetailed nicely with what I share with people, which is, A, you have a choice in what you drive. You've always had a choice in what you drive. You have more choices today than you ever have before. No one is going to take those choices away from you. And anyone who argues that, that, that they are is being disingenuous or perhaps uh, being intentionally dishonest with you. Um, and as more Americans are aware of the choices that are before them, we are increasingly confident that more of them are going to pick, choose to drive electric. Um, if you, you probably don't know, you know, you're right folks, you probably do know this, um, but you might be surprised if you didn't already know it to learn that 64,000 people in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania own an electric vehicle. That's how many of them are registered in this, in this state. Um, the overwhelming majority of those folks are really happy with the choice that they've made. We believe that as that number grows and multiplies, that the people who have made the choice to go electric and are happy with it are going to be the best ambassadors for future sales of, of electric cars, trucks, SUVs, and whatever it is that people want to get behind the wheel of and, and drive. Um, so that's, you know, my, my I wanna make myself available um, with any of EDF's research, thoughts, statistics that we possibly can. Also, you know, I'm, I'm not one for finger pointing, but I believe that bad acting needs to be called out. Um, the American fuel and petrochemical manufacturers specifically um, have aired nearly $3 million worth of misleading advertisements in Pennsylvania alone already. That's a number that sadly might increase. They are intentionally misleading Pennsylvanians that the policies that this administration have put forward have been a ban on the sale of internal combustion vehicles when no such ban exists. Um, so we're speaking loudly and clearly 
uh, to make sure that folks, you know, as they watch the evening news, they also are probably still watching the ads in between them as they see these ads. We think it's important that your readers know that the ads that are that are filling up the space in between the, the news segments on their local TV aren't true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that good overview. Let me begin by, by simply clearly just lay out for us, why are you actually promoting? I got a little sense you think it's going to be a better environment, right? And it's going to help with health issues. But maybe just one, two, three, the top reasons you are actually now with the EDF promoting actually electric cars. Yeah, look, I, I think number one is we are an organization that is incredibly focused on the climate crisis. We believe that it's real. We believe that the science of that is settled. Uh, I know you all have editorialized that on in, in, uh, on that point in in the past that we should have long ago moved past a discussion of is the climate crisis real or not to what are we going to do about it in terms of what we're going to do about it. Uh, transportation is the leading sector of American emissions. It's responsible for close to a third, 30 percent of American emissions. If we don't find ways to bring down uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, there is no way that we are going to address the climate crisis or do our part in, in as part of an international effort to, to address the climate crisis. The third reason is, as the leader of EDF Action, the C4 advocacy partner of the Environmental Defense Fund, I focus on the areas where there's a nexus between the greatest opportunity to reduce emissions and the most political heat or the most political salience. We've got Donald Trump out there every single day saying that EVs are going to be a disaster for the, the United States. I was dismayed to hear him in the debate the other night uh, at what first ignore a question on climate and then um, say something totally nonsensical sensical about how we had the best air and the best water ever under, under his watch and then pat himself on the back for saying H2O for some reason, the chemical compound for water. That was not a suitable answer for the times that we are living in and the crisis that we are facing. I don't have near the soapbox that Donald Trump does, but I wanna use whatever platform I have to bring the facts to the American people and to let them know that if they roll up their sleeves and join us, that the future is gonna be brighter for every single one of us. Okay. All right. Well, that that one, two, three, I think you've laid it out there. Let me open it up to our editorial board now to see if there are any questions. You guys know I can keep going on and on asking questions as I have a questioning mind, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask your questions now. Yes, Dr. Joshi and then and Jeff. Well, so the question I have is um, other than the potential issue that you put out early, which is the issue of choice, that people, it's an inherently American thing to be able to have choice in what we do and how we do it and so on, right? Uh, and we can make stupid choices if we want to, that's fine too. But the point is that that's, I think, an important, I can understand where people come from, you know, come from in that regard. Other than that, what have been some of the uh, potential criticisms or pushbacks um, in promoting what you're promoting, which from a purely scientific standpoint, whether it be medical, whether it be the environment, whether it be what have you, from a scientific standpoint, to my mind seems straightforward. So what are the political pushbacks? I, I, you know, a, a, the choice one, which you've already mentioned, Dr. Joshi, is a powerful one. That's why um, I, voices on the other side from us are spending millions and millions of dollars to mislead the American people. I presume that they would not be so foolish as to spend tens of millions of dollars on an advertising campaign without doing some polling first and finding in their polling that yes, the idea of Americans being ripped away of their choices doesn't sit well with most of us. It wouldn't sit well with me either. Um, but additional arguments uh, uh, and concerns that well-meaning people have is I think there's a perception that electric vehicles are toys for affluent coastal elites, and they don't see people behind the wheel of them here in places like mm -hmm. Harrisburg. Um, EDF Action has done some research looking into who actually has bought uh, electric vehicles 
It's why in my opening comments, I mentioned, you might be surprised to learn there's 64,000 electric vehicles today registered here in, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, a concern that people have is over range anxiety. Nobody wants to get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm sharing with folks is first and foremost, the overwhelming majority of charging that happens in this country happens in people's homes. You go home, you plug the thing into the wall. Maybe you have a level two charger. If you if you felt like bringing an electrician out to in, install it, that can charge your car in a couple of hours instead of overnight. Me with my plug-in hybrid minivan, I just have the outlet that came with the thing. It would cost me 60 bucks for a replacement one. I just plug it into a regular outlet. Um, Susan Quinn, our, our EV owner who participated in the press conference today said, you know, I plug mine in at home. It uses no more electricity while it's charging than my hairdryer does. Uh, I'd never heard that before. I credit her with the line, not me. Um, but the overwhelming majority of charging that happens happens in people's homes. But as we work to build out this na nationwide network of charging stations, and I was in Lansing, Michigan last month, a very similar place to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the state capital of, of Michigan. Um, they won an award from the Department of Transportation to um, have, I think, about $8 million go towards the install of 50 charging stations throughout the capital region there. Even though the majority of charging is going to happen for people in their homes, seeing those chargers out and about in their community and recognizing, hey, I'm not going to get stuck if I really needed a charge and a plug and to plug in is going to give folks additional confidence that this is the right decision for them. But on every key metric on performance, if power's your thing, if you want to put the, the pedal down and and see the thing go, good luck finding an F-150 that's powered by gas that can do zero to 60 in 3.1 seconds the way that the F-150 Lightning can. Um, that, you know, I, I already mentioned that I have a, a plug-in hybrid um, minivan, a Chrysler Pacifica to drive my kids around on. The most money that I've spent on repairs in the four years that I've, I've owned the thing, and this one's on me, I didn't get an oil change because I relied so much on electricity for my driving around. When you get your oil changed, they often rotate your tires for you. I wore out the shoes on my car and needed to spend $1,200 on a new set of tires for it because I'd never thought to rotate them because I didn't have to get an oil change. Like pain at the pump, nobody misses that. So on hmm. the metrics, people are gonna be happy with this choice once they make it, but vested interests are sparing no expense and not telling the truth in trying to dissuade people from making that transition faster um, to protect their narrow interests and their ability to profit. So probably too long of an answer, Dr. Joshi, but I hope it, it addressed your question. He likes long answers. He probably has a follow-up. Go ahead, Dr. Joshi. No, no I'm right. good. I'm good, Joyce. Thank you. Right. I'll let, I'll Jeff, let you free take over. Yep. Jeff, go ahead. Well, I, you've answered a lot of what I have said. I will say right off the bat, uh, my disappointment is that we have not yet been able to access George Jetson's flying cars. Uh, I, I would be all in favor of that. Uh, but I, I, I do think, you, you know, we're about to celebrate the 4th of July. And as we all know, everybody that uh, signed on to the 4th of July got there to Independence Hall by riding a horse. By the end of the next century, Henry Ford was out with some wheels and gasoline powered cars. And at this point in time, that's everything. When I go to the giant grocery store over here in Camp Hill, I do see charging stations there. Uh, so I think that's a good thing. In other words, what I'm saying is, I, I just think that you, you, as with any other product, you have to convince the American people, the customer, that this is a great thing to do. It's cheap, it's dependable, they can roll into any place and fill up the tank as it were. I don't think we're there yet, but I, I don't think it's impossible to get there. I just think this takes time and doing the kind of uh, work that you're doing, which is, uh, you know, um, it, it takes a while and it could seem boring and drive you crazy, but that's how these things get sold. Surely that's what was going on with Henry Ford when people thought he was crazy. 
Yeah, and, and I think I, you're, you're right to mention the spirit of entrepreneurship and also the pace at which technological advancements happen in this country. Just as Susan mentioned in our press conference this morning, how her first EV just five years ago in the dark ages of EVs got 50 miles on a, on a charge. And now we're talking about electric vehicles that get 300 to sometimes in some cases 500 miles per charge. That's a huge difference, and that's happened over a very short window of time. The advancements that we're making in batteries and in storage and the tax credits that were within the Inflation Reduction Act to onshore battery building here in the United States everywhere are astronomical. EDF's research says that we've brought in $188 billion worth of private sector investment with 60% of that coming just since the, the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act into, into law. Um, I got to see some focus groups of voters in, in or hear it learned secondhand about some focus groups from some voters in a different Commonwealth, Kentucky, ahead of their governor's election in November of, of 2023. And a term that I heard kept coming up organically was not electric vehicles, it was battery powered cars. Um, and what Kentuckians were saying over and over again was, I don't know about EVs, but battery powered cars, I could see myself behind the wheel of one of those because they knew that the battery would be assembled just down the down the road. So mm -hmm. I, I believe deeply in the technology. I believe in the power of the advocacy of the people who own them to be the best ambassadors for them that there possibly can be. But I also believe that I see President Reagan over your shoulder, as he famously said, you got to trust but verify um, when there are actors in the public square that are sharing anything less than the truth with the American people. It's our responsibility to speak out and to be very, very clear um, that they're a not telling the truth and b that they have a vested interest in it. Well, you know, he always, he also used to say that the best thing for the inside of a man was the outside of a horse. So, uh, but, and one, and one other point that I would make, um, and not to discriminate against myself and some of my colleagues, but we're, uh, as it were, oldsters, and I'm not into ageism, but I think that uh, you, you will make a lot of progress when you aim this, a lot of it to young people, high school kids and kids who are learning to drive. Uh, they are the future. And if their future includes a present where this is omnipresent to them, then they're not going to think twice about it. It's people like me that have spent their entire life with a gas powered car. They go, ah, I don't know here. So uh, I think we like to save money. So if they can convince me that this thing is not going to stop on me and I'm going to keep money in my right. Our generation likes to save. Right? All right. I'll, I'll get you a horse then. <laughs> <laughs> that might work, but it can't get me there quick enough. But thank you. Jeffrey. Let me let me bring in Reverend Strauss. Sandy Strauss. Uh, yes, I, um, I I just we, we traveled to uh, visit our my brother-in-law and sister-in-law in, -law in um, up in Canada, they have an electric car, but they took their hybrid instead because they said the problem is that the network of chargers is just not in place. And I know there are places that are doing that. Uh, you mentioned Lansing, you see them around here, around town at Giant and places like that. What more is being done to build out that network in places where people can be able to stop. And um, they they said, well, we could find chargers sometimes, but we'd be on the charger for hours because they were not the rapid chargers. So what's being done to try to build out that network more and better? Yeah, I, I, that's a, a great question. Um, and in politics, there is an expression uh, called walking the plank when leadership makes their members take an unpopular vote uh, with their constituents back home. I believe that the days of any plank walking around climate policy are behind us because I think we've turned the corner and are working very hard to erase this false choice between doing the right thing for the economy and doing the right thing for the planet. The, the vast majority of Americans believe that 
there are good paying jobs in our future in clean energy, and they'd like to see them coming to their communities and their constituents uh, if they're if they're in elected office. Um, in terms of your direct question, I you know I, I, the plank walking point is important because if I could wave a wand and make uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law all the way done and fully implemented today, I would have done that. If we could have waved a wand on day one, even with the outlays and the money going out the door to fix all of our roads and bridges and broadband and build out a nationwide network of charging stations and fix our crumbling grid, which is a part of our energy grid, which is a part of our infrastructure that we don't see, but that we all rely on every single day, I would have done it. And, and every single policymaker who I talked to would have done it as well. So. The bipartisan infrastructure law includes seven and a half billion dollars to build out a nationwide charging network. I was just joined by Ed Hill, an international representative for the IBEW. He talked about the expert training that their members are receiving above and beyond their certification through their apprenticeship process and how ready they are to deliver on this complicated and dangerous work um, and on how they are building out um, charging superchargers across the Pennsylvania Turnpike as part of the NEVI program, which is overseen by the Department of Transportation, but that they're also partnering with companies like Sheets and Wawa. And Jeff, you mentioned the seeing them at the Giant. Um, they're doing that everywhere. So the seven and a half billion dollars that's included um, in the bipartisan infrastructure law that the president negotiated and signed um, that's only a part of the story. The private investment from firms and, and businesses and stores that say, you know what, I'd like a captive audience for about 20 minutes because I bet if these guys have to pull over and charge their um, electric car, at a minimum, they're going to want a Gatorade or something and they might buy some other stuff too. Um, a story I just told somebody else is, I don't live here, I, I drove up from Washington, D.C., my life is dominated by my son's travel baseball schedule. Um, he's got a teammate and I was talking to one of the other dads. They live on Capitol Hill. They don't have off street parking. Parking can be tough. They bought an electric vehicle or they leased an electric vehicle and it came with two or three, I forget which, full years of absolutely free charging. Um, from a, a charging outfit that had linked up with the car company that sold him the, the car. He takes his son to baseball practice on Saturday afternoon, dips out, goes to the Walmart up the street, plugs it in, charges for 20 minutes. And he says, I said, has that ever caused you any inconvenience? He goes, no, I used to have to gas up my car once a week. It's like my weekly trip to power up my car, except now it doesn't cost me anything. I come back and I watch the rest of Benji's baseball practice and I'm super happy and, and it gets me through the entire week. That's a pretty good deal for my son's teammates. Family. Um, and as we tell more of those stories to more people, uh, other folks are going to be happier. So there is, there is federal money that is going out to states right now to build charging along our interstate highway system. But there's also private money that, private companies are making a decision that, yes, we want to partner with these charging companies um, to make charging more available because we want a captive audience and we want customers who are going to be around for a little bit. Dr. Joshi, you, you also asked a, an open-ended question earlier about what other impediments are there. As somebody who drives a plug-in hybrid, I'll tell you, one of the things that's a pain for me is this hodgepodge of different charging out, uh, outfits and how every single one of them, unlike the horse that Jeffrey mentioned, um, you know, requires a different app in order to be able to charge. Uh, one of the unheralded pieces of news that has come out that makes me even more optimistic over the past several months is that Google is going to step in and help to fix this patchwork so that using one interface you can find in a rational way where uh, all of the charging is. Because as a driver, I don't care if it's charge point or rewiring, uh, you know, powering, repowering America or whichever of these charging networks it is. 
I, if I'm running out of charge, I just want to know where I can go to plug it in and find an available charger so that Google is stepping in to address um, this inefficiency where different closed networks aren't talking to one another is, I think, an enormous source of, uh, should be an enormous source of relief for the American people once they know it. Okay, um, I think uh, Gloria has had her hand up for a while. Gloria, you have to unmute. You have to unmute, Gloria. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question regarding promoting access and inclusivity. The Latino community is, you know, back the use of, uh, from what I've read, uh, 43% um, of Latinos back the use of electric vehicles. But in terms of affordability, and I do work in a low income community and we do not, I've never seen a, an electric vehicle drive through there. And so I'm curious, like what kind of subsidies or federal dollars are being put into promoting equal, you know, um, equity and energy in terms of uh, these these vehicles. What's being done so that these vehicles are more affordable to everyone in the community? But that's an excellent question. I'd say the federal government is doing far more in terms of the actual affordability than socializing the affordability of them to people. Uh, and I think that's the right place to focus. Um, I'll point to two very specific policies right now. Starting on January 1st of this year, it's brand new. Um, they've got what car people call cash on the hood, an instant rebate available, knocking $7,500 off of the sticker price of, a, of a, uh, an electric car, truck, or SUV. That's real money. Uh, and that's real money to people buying a new car. New cars are expensive, and they've gotten more expensive since the pandemic with the supply chain challenges as well. The cost of a new car is too high, um, but we're pleased to see that the cost of electric vehicles has come down precipitously. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to pull up, pull out a fact sheet. I'm, I know most of this stuff cold, but this is one where I don't want to guess. Um, we talking prices in PA. Yeah, thirty-five models under forty-eight k, twelve models. Under Thank 35K. you. There are thirty-five different models available for less than forty-eight thousand dollars today. Uh, $48,000 is significant because that's the median price of a, of a new car. Yep. There are 12 models here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that are available for less than $35,000 today. Um, that's still a lot of money. Um, I, I'm not expert in this, um, but one area where these instant rebates um, are having a real impact is they count against your down payment if you lease a uh, uh, an electric car or truck. Um, so they bring, in some cases, the monthly payment down by 50% or more what you're paying out of pocket for a new, uh, to lease a new electric vehicle for a period of two or three years. In my own family, my wife got a plug-in hybrid last summer. Um, we penciled it out and leasing it just made so much more sense for, for her than, than buying it. Um, so that's one way that this administration is bringing down the cost of cars for everyone and, and will have benefit for Latinos. Um, for lower income people, a new car is unfortunately a luxury item that many of them may never have. So the fact that the Inflation Reduction Act includes for the first time ever a $4,000 tax credit for used electric vehicles um, is a big, big deal. Uh, and a big deal for lower income people. Um, I will also share like on the, you know, I, I'm all about choice and um, access and the lens through which we're trying to view these problems is to convince consumers to buy more of them. But we also are aware of the underlying reasons why we are fighting for cleaner air um, out there. The impacts of polluted air of carbon pollution from transportation are not distributed at all evenly um, and wind up being disproportionate burdens on low-income families everywhere. 
especially African Americans and Latinos. Um, and Dr. Gentile, Gentile spoke to that this morning in, in her remarks in our, our press conference. Um, so if we get this right, there will be more choices for more consumers at every end of the economic spectrum and of every race, creed, and color. Um, and there will be cleaner air for all of us, especially for the people who have been disproportionately burdened by dirty air for far too long. Thank you yeah. for that. That's a good question, Gloria. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, let me do this. I'm going to take a question from Jan that she's typed in, and then I'm going to ask David Dix, who's got his hand up. Uh, but Jan says the legislature has wrestled with charging an annual fee on electric vehicle registration to make up the lost gas tax revenue. But there is some concern if they impose a fee that is too high, it will dissuade people from buying EVs. Is that a legitimate concern? She wants to know. And she says the Senate approved the $200, $290 annual fee. The House wants to start lower and ratchet it up over time. And, and just one more question as you take it, because she's another one with lots of questions. She says, if everyone or many more people buy EVs, can our electric grid support it? So the short answer is yes. Um, as Susan pointed out, our, our EV owner in our press conference this morning, when she plugs her car in at home, just plugging it into a wall outlet, it doesn't use up any more power than her hairdryer does uh, during the time when it's in, in use. Um, since the majority of charging happens at home um, overnight, it happens during non-peak hours. So it actually provides less strain on our grid than, uh, than um uh, other things do. Um, so, and, and EDF has done some research in this area and has found that we absolutely have the energy capacity to support an electric transition today if it were to go faster and if we were able to wave the, that magic wand, that we would still be in a very good shape if tomorrow every American decided to start buying electric vehicles instead of gas powered ones. So, on the last question, the answer is it, it, it is a definitive yes. Um, in terms of whether or not the legislature should impose a fee on electric vehicles to make up for lost gas tax, tax revenue, um, I would again a, a, adopt a consumer's view on it. Um, is paying for our roads and, and bridges and infrastructure important? Of course it is. But that's a, pa that's a, that's a payment and a tax that is borne by consumers and is part of the pain at the pump that consumers experience and feel. Um, from a public policy perspective and from my perspective, I think the faster we get people into electric vehicles, the better off we will all be in terms of public health, in terms of driver experience, in terms of everything. Um, and I view the shrinking of gas tax revenue as a good thing in the aggregate and the long term and a good thing for consumers. There's no question that we are going to have to, in the long run, figure out how to continue to maintain and pay for our roads and, and highways. Um, but I would, I, I would caution against adopting any sort of tax right now that would uh, potentially dissuade people from making that shift because of the enormous public health benefits and the consumer benefits that making that transition will, will come with. Um, the climate crisis is one of those rare things in this country where the cost of inaction absolutely dwarfs the cost of taking action. And a legislator needing a justification for why there should, they should tolerate a short-term shortfall in revenue for roads and bridges um, should look to the enormous damage caused by extreme weather events exacerbated by the climate crisis. They should look to the lost productivity and wages that people like me experience when their kids' summer camp gets canceled because of extraordinary heat and bad air quality. Uh, they should look to the lost productivity and the lost wages and, and lost um, production 
that the entire eastern United States, including Harrisburg, experienced last year due to the massive amounts of sw smoke from the Canadian wildfires, uh, which were a byproduct of, of the climate crisis. Um, it was staggering to me, and I, I spent some time writing about it, how I was in New York and Washington, D.C., two cities that you, they're not industrial cities anymore. You wouldn't expect them ever to have the lowest air quality of any major city in the world, but that's exactly what we had last summer. Um, we cannot afford to continue with the status quo. We need to speed this transition as fast as we can. And if we're successful in doing that, I have every confidence that we'll find a way to figure out how to pay for our roads and bridges and I wouldn't think that any responsible person would argue that we could just allow them to continue to fall into disrepair. Um, that was what Trump did, and it didn't work. Um, I had to take the long way up from Washington, D.C., because traffic in downtown Baltimore, both ends of rush hour, irrespective of which way you're going, takes about 30 minutes longer today than it did um, before that uh, the key bridge uh, was crashed into and, and collapsed. We, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law that we passed is important. It's transformative, but it was long overdue when it was signed into law three years ago. Um, we should have fixed our roads and bridges 20 years ago and are kicking that can down the road for far too long was a national failure that we're all paying the cost for now. Thank you for that. David, oh, did, oh sorry, go ahead, Elaine. A quick quote to, to David's uh, remarks on extreme weather as we sit here today, there is a category five hurricane in the Eastern Caribbean. And I believe this is the earliest that a category five storm has ever formed in the Caribbean barrel. And it just, extreme weather is real and it's a problem. It's already flattening islands in the Eastern Caribbean. Yeah, that's yep. very true, very true. Yep. Elaine. David, did you have a question? I Your hand is down, I'm not sure it was answered. I did. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, and thank you both for taking the time to explain this very uh, critical, important issue. Uh, I wanted to talk, something you said about the supply chain uh, brought a question to mind, and, and that's the, the downside of the supply chain. When you think about the extraction of lithium and cobalt and many times being used by ch child labor in the global south, I'd love to hear about you know how you incorporate that. And many scientists have said that the extraction of lithium and cobalt, many times often by hand, is not sustainable uh, for the demand that the EV vehicles will have in the next uh, coming decades. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, look, I, I think there is no question that the issue of critical mineral sourcing for batteries is um, a tricky one. Um, but there also, you know, there is clarity around the climate benefits of switching to an electric vehicle versus continuing to drive a car powered by an internal combustion engine today. Um, and that question has been, as EDF's research shows, definitively answered and addressed. There is no question that driving an electric vehicle today um, has far less climate impact than uh, continuing to drive a car powered by an internal combustion engine. Um, you also, but that it wasn't just the climate benefits that you mentioned, David. You also talked about uh, fundamental questions of, of equity and whether anyone has any tolerance for relying upon child labor or forced labor anywhere in the world. Everyone's answer to that question should be the same as mine unequivocally, categorically, no. Um, I think there are big efforts underfoot. Uh, the Secretary of Energy, Jen Granholm, who was the former governor of Michigan, is very loud and forceful voice on, on this point, and there are others, um, to bring home sourcing of critical minerals. I don't want to sound too like, you know, as Jeff put it, Jetsonian, um, but Jeffrey's <laughs> reminder to all of us of the speed of technological innovation at the dawn of the automotive age should be top of mind for us today. Um, just because today you need lithium and cobalt in order to power a battery that lets a car go for 300 or 400 miles doesn't mean that tomorrow's cars will include that technology. Um, I've spent some time with the CEO of a company called Sela Technologies um, the, the guy is an engineer who was one of, I think, like the seventh employee at um, Tesla. 
his big bet is that we can use silicon to uh, silica to power our, our batteries and graphite as well. So uh, finding other materials that are capable of holding energy in an efficient way and releasing it when you want it to be released. Um, companies are spending massive amounts of R&D dollars um, that are being matched by tax credits today to try to solve those challenges. Um, and personally, as a, EDF is a global place, um, I work at you know EDF Action, the advocacy partner whose purview is entirely exclusively domestic. Um, I'm an American citizen and a proud American. It's why I've engaged in the public square all, all this time and, and in this way. My vision of an electric future is one where as many components are sourced and assembled here in the United States and the United States of America is putting forward a competitive product that can compete with anything manufactured by anyone anywhere else in the world and do it according to our highest labor standards in, in the world. That's the electric future that I'd like to see. Um, and that from the time I've spent on these issues, I think is possible. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions that have not? Oh, yes, Jeffrey, go I ahead. Just one, one observation. And listening to all of this, when I was, uh, we lived in Virginia when I was a teenager for a couple of years, and that's where I learned to drive. And in Virginia, primarily because there were so many rural areas where they needed teenagers to drive tractors, the driver's license age was 14. So I turned 14 and I got to use the family car with dad in it, who was, whose hair was growing grayer by the moment. And uh, the town we lived in was built on hills and the car was, uh, you had to use a clutch to, to run the car. And the, one of the reasons for it was an automatic, as they called it, was so much more expensive that you had to use the, you know, that if you could afford a car, the car you used was not an automatic. Well, now, of course, everybody has an automatic. And my point is, I think that's just, you know, the way of the world here. We will see a day when you yeah. you need to get a car, you go out and you get an electric car and nobody thinks twice about it. But you do need to make sure that the cost is appropriate, that the cost comes down. Um, that people get used to them, uh, old-fashioned capitalism and selling and all that kind of thing. I don't think that that sort of point of things has ever changed or ever will change. Ah, uh, what wisdom of the ages, Jeffrey. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> that gray hair is there for something. So, <laughs> Gloria I'm not 14 anymore. <laughs> you didn't have to tell us, but go ahead. <laughs> we like sparring like this. Anyway, Gloria is saying, why all the EV advocacy? Why not continue both gas or electric vehicles in the future? I think that's been answered, but I'll give you the last say on why, once again, you're pushing EV and urging people to consider it when they purchase their next car. Well, not, number one, the climate benefits. Two, the benefits to consumers that they will realize. They go faster, they cost less to repair, they alleviate pain at the pump. Three, um, advocates for gas-powered cars, especially the oil and gas industry, are very loudly advocating for their priorities and misleading uh, your readers and all of the residents of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the process. We feel a strong sense of obligation to step forward and, and to cite the facts. So the fact is consumers have been buying gas powered cars for a long time. I've bought my share of them, quite a few of them over, over the years. I don't intend to buy another one again, but advocates for gasoline consumption and additional fossil fuel use, let's not pretend that they're being silent. They certainly are not. Um, they've, they've appeared relatively recently, I think, in, uh, in, in your op-ed pages in, in the form of an op-ed that ran recently from former Congressman Costello, uh, parroting industry talking points. That's fine. I wish they would tell the truth, but advocates are going to advocate. We're advocating for a cleaner future for everyone that will lead to more American good paying jobs and lead to better outcomes for consumers. And we're confident that consumers will follow us and make those same choices 
if they're appraised of all of the facts. And we are, are, are hopeful, I take nothing for granted, um, that, that you all as the editorial um, board will um, take this conversation and, and help to in, better in, inform and educate your, your readers about the real choices that they have before them and the real um, misinformation that they are hearing from some corners. I don't ask that you, you put our spin on anything. All we ask is that you put forward a set of facts to the, the to your readers um, so that they can draw their own informed conclusions. Right. Well, we appreciate your taking the time and uh, letting us know about these. These are crucial issues, and we are on the cusp of great changes. I think with 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 vehicles in this country, um, and uh, you know, but it's complicated. And and as Jeff says, it takes time for people to get used to new stuff. <laughs> but but we're getting there, thanks to people like you. So I want to thank my editorial board once again for being here with us. I want to thank Dave and Elaine from the EDF for for their great expertise and sharing it. And we'll see how things go. We will at some point do an editorial on this probably very soon. All right. And don't forget the flying car. No, but right. it, it, just really, re really quickly, like I am, yeah. as you guys can hear, passionate about this set of issues and nose down in it. But I know our world is facing a great many challenges and it's the purview of your board to consider a lot of them and all of them. So I'm really humbled by the time that you all spent with me and with us today. Uh, I'm really, really grateful for it. And I, I don't I don't take it for granted. So thank you all so much for for having us and to let us get really focused and, and narrow on the thing that we're out spending the most of our time about, because I know you guys have to consider everything. That's right. Well, thank you yeah. all. Well, enjoy right. the rest of your day. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.